On episode 509 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss the art of quitting. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 509. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hey, Raz, how are things going? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Uh, kind of getting back into the groove of being back in Bocas and, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, social events and things. We had a, a fundraiser, they had a fundraiser for the local guy that takes care of all the cats. So we have street cats and street dogs. Oh. And so this guy, he's always kind of played a part in help making sure that the cats and some of the dogs get fed. Mm -hmm. And then if they, you know, when they have a litter, he's always trying to catch the kittens and get them spayed and neutered. And so he's trying to catch cats and do all of that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, you know, everybody calls him Papa Gato. And he, he was doing a fundraiser. So it's kind of go there, hang out with friends and buy a t-shirt. And, you know, Neat. I think one guy, one of the local guys here uh, who's uh, really, really talented, uh, he's, uh, he, he was doing uh, the tattoos. He's a tattoo artist amongst other things. And he was donating the proceeds from all of his tattoos he did that day. And he doesn't do it like oh. with the little gun thing. He has a little, little pin thing that he does oh. by hand. So he draws things by hand on wow. people He's really talented, but, uh, yeah, so he was doing it. So they were doing a fundraiser. And so it's just kind of being back into the, the, the theme of the Island and we're getting ready to get kind of into busy season. So we're seeing more tourists and oh. a lot of people are, are popping up and opening restaurants that, you know, some that had closed and then some that, you know, were just, um, never there before because mm -hmm. this is, this is kind of the season to do it. And there's, um, there's one thing on this, on this Island that was it's kind of a, a big thing, particularly for the young backpackers is called uh, filthy Friday. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, it is exactly what you think it is. It's, <laughs> it's hundreds of people going to like a discotheque with a DJ and oh, they wow. basically, it's a, a pub crawl, if you will, but they hop from Island to Island. So there's typically like three places It used to be three places. I don't know how they're going to run it now, but there used to be three places. So they, they all get together at one place and then there's a series of boats to take them to the second place. And then a series of boats to take them to the third place. Hmm. And then it's, it's over. And so it starts about three o'clock in the afternoon and, and runs until they drop them off around six something. And then they can just hang out and enjoy themselves. It's terrifying. I would, I would never do it. Uh, Cause there's just too many people in, in a, a space. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we, there's a, I actually, I, I kind of get hives every time they got a, a billboard at the air, near the airport advertising there and there's like hundreds of kids standing on this deck and there's like no room to move they're all just standing mm. like face to face now pre-covid that gave me the eebie-jeebies um <laughs> to just be that packed in with that many people yeah. uh, not my thing but it is sort of one of those things that when that's going on it draws a lot of people to the islands so you see a lot more young backpackers and people on the island so it just kind of gives it more of that touristy vibe when you mm -hmm. have that going on. So even though it's not something I would ever want to do or care to do, uh, it's good to see that we're getting back to kind of a normal here. That's right. I, it sounds wonderful that restaurants are opening and, and all these activities are taking place again. It's nice to hear that things are changing a little bit. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean it won't go backwards at some point, but at least at this point, they didn't expect to reopen. In fact, they took our, we were doing classes in yoga studio and they took over the studio because the yoga teacher oh. quit because we couldn't pay the rent uh, while we're closed. And then when they wanted to reopen, it still wasn't tenable for us to run our classes. So we had to move out. She moved out and closed up. They took the people that were doing this filthy Friday, they took over that space and they turned it mm -hmm. into a big liquor store. Um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, so, so something to keep him going till he yeah. was able to get it, his uh, other business, his more lucrative business reopened. So it's just good. good again, cool. to, even though the folks that come to that don't spend a lot of money on the island, mm -hmm. it's just good to have them here because it gives the island kind of that healthy vibe. 
That's awesome. Sounds like fun from a distance. <laughs> yes, from a distance. You guys go over there. I, was like, I don't mind seeing them walk up and down the street, walk right by the walk, walk by right by the gym and go party your mm-hmm. butts off. But um, yeah, at the same time, it'll just be good to kind of see that starting to happen here. Sure. How are things up there? Oh, good, good. We're in the middle of October. The weather up here in Michigan is sometimes beautiful, sometimes frightening. It's uh, <laughs> the, the leaves are changing colors and dropping, which is always beautiful. And um, we are getting a little bit of rain today. We're going to hit 80. So that's kind of unusual. And sometimes in October, we might see a few snow flurries, although that hasn't happened yet and probably won't after not for at least another week or so, but that's the fun part of October. But while I'm mentioning it, I want to remind everybody that October is also reserved for breast cancer awareness and for all the ladies out there to make sure they schedule their mammograms as soon as they get the chance. Absolutely. Do that. We, yeah, we talk, we've yeah. talked about screening. We've talked about cancer mm-hmm. a good yeah. bit and we'll keep talking about that. Uh, but the screening that you need to do is, is it's critically important if you want to stay healthy. Um, yeah. I did have one aside though, that I want to do. Sure. Um, this episode is going live on the 25th. And so we're less than a week away from Halloween. Oh yeah. And so now there's going to be all this candy in your house. And if you hmm. have a sweet tooth, that's an issue. And so I, I, I did a little bit of reading on this because I did, I did want to talk about it. I, I thought I might end up being actually doing an episode on it, uh, but then realized there's probably not enough content to do a whole episode. But a couple tips that I found, uh, one of these I got from U.S. News and World Reports article. It's five, six years old, but they made a few recommendations. So you get this candy. They recommended some things like make cookies. So you take the chocolate or cookie or whatever it is, or the cake, you know, I mean, a, a candy bar, a piece of candy, and you make cookies and you put these in the cookies while you cook them. And so mm-hmm. they kind of make it part of the cookie. And then rather than eating them <laughs> and just adding more to your, your candy, uh, put mm-hmm. those away as, as holiday cookies. And then you have ready-made in the freezer gifts for when the holiday, when Christmas actually rolls around. So you get the Christmas Ooh, tins, you bake the cookies, put them in there and you can repurpose those candies rather than eat them. Nice. Um, another one was uh, to basically to donate them. And they had a couple here, Ronald McDonald's house, or even the troops, even though I know we're not as heavily involved overseas now, there still are troops overseas uh, that you can actually donate your candy to. So they'll take your candy for you and just ship it to them. You can look that stuff up online. I'll have a link to this U.S. News and World Report article, and hopefully some of those links are still the same. The other is to look at opportunities for things that are coming up. Like, for example, my daughter's birthday is on the 14th of December. Mm-hmm. And so as she were younger, I could take the candy and put it in a pinata for her birthday. Oh, okay. Great. And the kids would have a pinata. That candy would go into the pinata. Uh, and, and there you go. Uh, and then the final one was uh, bring it to work. And again, that depends on where you work and how those folks will feel about the fact that you're trying to offload your candy on them. Some people will love it. <laughs> sure. Other people won't. Uh, but yeah, just taking it to work. Now, again, if you're going to put it on your desk, uh, realize that that's going to be an issue maybe because it's sitting there and you might end up eating more of it than you'd like to. So take it to the break room or something like that, where there's public area where they can get to it and you don't see it all the way. But one of the best tips I saw while I was doing my research was this. When you're buying Halloween candy, buy something you don't like. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I always made this mistake. I'd go out and buy the Snickers because the little bite-sized Snickers and uh, Milky Ways and things like that. And then the, um, what is it? The Hershey's chocolates, the dark chocolates, because that was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you don't give out the candy, you're stuck with the candy. Right. You can do one of these other things, but if you buy a candy that you don't particularly like, like for me, it'd be black licorice. Oh, Can't gosh. stand this stuff. Can't stand me it either. at all. <laughs> so if I had black licorice, that would be a perfect, you know, uh, candy corns would also be one. Uh, although mm-hmm. some people love them. I'm, I'm not one of those people that love them. So again, candy that I wouldn't, you know, a lot of people, the black and orange peanut butter kind of candy. I actually like those, which is sad because oh. uh, <laughs> they're horrible, but I, I don't know. They like them. Uh, so just kind of thinking in terms of if you're buying this candy as you're in there shopping, obviously you don't want to be the house that gets egged because you, you're giving out <laughs> substandard candy, but 
just buy a candy that you don't like that most people, other people do like. And then you're less inclined to sit there and, and nibble and pick on them during Halloween and then having them in your house afterwards. Uh, you're less inclined to, to deal with those. So yeah. have a strategy. Right. You know, I talk to my mm-hmm. clients all the time. When you go into a situation that you are familiar with, which this is, it happens every year about this time, have a strategy for how you get through this. If you know that you have a sweet tooth and you know that this is something that's tripped you up in the past, have your strategy so you can work around it. That's great. Great tips. Definitely. All right. Are you ready to get into the episode on the art of quitting? Sure. All right. Today, I want to talk about the art of quitting. Now, I know that sounds kind of odd to be talking about quitting when we're talking about health and fitness, uh, because we as a people, particularly in the United States, we really appreciate perseverance. We appreciate those people, those stories where people have gone above and beyond and accomplished things way beyond the realm of what's possible or seemed possible at the beginning, like the movie Rudy or the book Rudy or the story of Rudy, who uh, tried to get on to and play for Notre Dame and actually did get on the field uh, during a football game with the team uh, through perseverance. And we love that story. Uh, There's also the children's book, The Little Engine That Could by Waddy Piper. And again, it's a story about perseverance and and going at it and having the right attitude and sticking with it until you get something that seemed impossible done. And we love those stories. But there's also stories that kind of push back the other way, like in Greek mythology with Sisyphus uh, pushing that rock up the hill that's invariably going to roll down the hill again. So no matter um, how much perseverance that he puts into that effort, he's going to end up right back where he started. Or, you know, we're watching Rocky Four and Apollo is fighting Drago in an exhibition match, and Rocky knows the next punch is going to basically kill his friend, but he doesn't throw the towel in. And a lot of people were upset about that in the movie. I was upset about it watching the movie. Uh, It was a very emotional point in that movie. And in a sense, we fault Rocky for not quitting, not throwing in the towel. And we know that that was because Apollo wanted to continue the fight all the way through to the end. And it ended up costing him his life. And so there's these stories that we have about perseverance and then about quitting. And they both have a place, particularly when we're talking about health and fitness. So I want to talk today about some times when quitting is actually the right answer, that you're better off quitting something than sticking with it, okay? So sometimes when you quit, it just opens up opportunities. And we're going to talk all the way through this uh, as you look at how quitting might actually help you get to the results you want faster. So for this discussion, we're going to talk about big things. We're not going to be talking about quitting little things like, you know, quitting sugar or quitting this or quitting that. Obviously, you know, there's challenges and and structure and things and strategies and tactics and things you're going to implement that will work and not work. And some of those strategies and tactics you just throw away because they're obviously not working. But we're going to talk about some big things in the health, fitness, and joy categories, because in reality, this is literally life and death. Now, maybe not right now, but some of the decisions you're making are going to decide which side of the aging curve you're actually on as you go forward in life. So what we're going to talk about is the key, five key health and fitness drivers, the five key health and fitness drivers. And those are nutrition, which includes hydration, sleep, stress management, fitness, and avoiding toxicity. And that can be chemical, biological, or emotional. So we have those five key health drivers, and today we're going to go through those five key health drivers and look at some scenarios where it might make sense to not stick. It might make sense to quit, okay? Now, here's the other caveat as we get into this discussion, because I'm going to be throwing out some examples, and I want you to understand that sometimes the decision that you need to make is different than the decision I might need to make. So as we go through this discussion, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit on that so you can kind of get a flavor for how to do this analysis, if you will. So first, I want to talk about a few reasons why you should probably stick to what you're doing, okay? If your strategy is sound and you just need more time, so, you know, everything's working, it's generally working, and you just need to give it more time for you to see the results that you want to see, that's probably a good reason to stick. If it's working, but not as fast as you wanted, 
Now, what there might be instead of quitting is just alternatives that you can add on to make it better. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then another reason to stick is there really isn't another alternative. This is really the only way that's available to you based on who you are, what's going on in your life, um, or anything else. And we'll, we'll get into that as well. But what are the reasons that we should quit? Okay. If the thing you're doing isn't serving you, you should quit and try to find another way. If you know in your heart of hearts that there actually is a better way, you were just trying this as an opportunity and it's not working for you, and this other way would be quicker and easier, it's probably time to quit. And also, we want to make sure that quitting won't hurt us and that what we are doing is helping us. So if there's something you're doing that's not helping you, then quit. And and we'll talk about that as well. So what I'm going to do for the remainder of this podcast is I'm literally going to go through each of the five drivers and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And then we're going to kind of talk through a little bit. Is that a good reason to quit? Is this something you should quit? And I'm going to give my opinion on it from my perspective. Realize, again, your answers could be entirely different than my answer. So your circumstances would be entirely different than mine. And you should think through these scenarios to kind of get an idea of how this process goes. So the first key driver that I want to talk about is nutrition. So here's the scenario. You are three weeks into the carnivore way of eating. You even quit coffee and tea. And while you've lost weight, your energy level has bottomed out and you're constipated. So is this a stick, a stick and pivot, or a quit? Now, obviously, for some people, the carnivore diet is fairly extreme, and it's very difficult to do long-term for a lot of people. Now, other people thrive on that kind of diet, and that's fine. But if you're having issues with your energy level, and you're just not feeling like you're losing weight the way that you should, and you're dealing with other biological problems like constipation, it's time to think about that. For some people, it's obvious that you need to quit and maybe do something different. For others, it might just be a a stick and pivot. So maybe you're not getting enough electrolytes. Um, Maybe uh, you need to implement something else like better sleep or something else to help you make sure that you're keeping your energy level up. And then obviously with the electrolytes, as I spoke to, that can include magnesium, that can include uh, potassium and sodium. And in many cases, the introduction of magnesium might help with that constipation. So you can kind of see as you go into this concept of I'm trying a way of eating carnivore and I intend to do it for a long time, but I'm starting to have difficulties with it. You can answer the question of, okay, is this something I can just pivot, try some add-ons and see what works, or do I really want to quit this? And in many cases, I would say, if this was something you really wanted to do, try the stick and pivot for a little while. And then if that doesn't work, quit. Okay, here's a second scenario for nutrition. You cut your calories much lower than you're used to eat. It was working for a few weeks, but you're hungry all the time and you find yourself binging at night. Stick, stick and quit. I mean, stick and pivot or quit. Now, this one's a little bit more difficult because a lot of people will want to follow the calories in, calories out model. And the reality is, For a time, that can definitely work. But over time, your body is going to adjust to try to find homostasis based on the amount that you're eating today, based on the exercise you're doing today. It's going to find that balance. And so the question then is, is this low calorie going to work for you long term? For some people, just pushing through a little while can restart the weight loss. But you may need to do a couple of pivots. You may need to have a couple days where your calorie is a little higher just to keep your metabolism, keep everything flowing so your body's not locked into a $1,200 calorie a day thing. Maybe just having a couple of days where you're up closer to 18 or maybe 2,000 might be enough for your body to adapt and adjust to a point where it can continue to lose weight. That would be a stick and pivot. But for a lot of people, just cutting calories isn't enough. They need to focus on what they're eating, when they're eating as well to try to figure this out. And so sometimes you just have to quit that low calorie and figure out a different way. So I hope that made sense as I went through the nutrition piece of this, that 
there are different answers for each of us based on what we're what we're dealing with, where we are in our lives, and what's working and what's not. So there's stick, there's stick and pivot, and there's quit. And you have to look and figure out which one makes the most sense for you. And many times, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes stick and pivot is the right answer. And then if that doesn't work, then you quit. So let's move on to the second key driver of health and fitness and joy, sleep. <laughs> and this is one of my favorites. Okay, so let's. here's the scenario, the first scenario. You usually go to bed at 1030, and you've recently hired a personal trainer that can only work with you at 5 a.m. This only gives you six hours of bedtime and less than six hours of sleep. You know you need more. Stick, stick and pivot, or quit. Now, this is a tougher one because for a lot of people, their time is locked and they're very deep into getting a lot done and being productive. And the concept of sleeping more is often difficult for us. It, it, it feels like we're, we're giving up, feels almost like we're quitting something. But in a sense, getting more sleep can help you have more energy, get more done, be more productive, and definitely have fewer mistakes and issues. So the question then here is we've got two endpoints to this sleeping night. Now, you could try to go to sleep earlier, but that might mean giving up family time. That might mean giving up time with your significant other, uh, time that you love to spend together. You know, you obviously, if you've made dinner, we've got to wash dishes, we've got to get things cleaned up. So there's a there's a, a probably a limit to how far you can push your bedtime up. And then on the other side, yes, you've hired this personal trainer that really only had that five o'clock window. Is there a way to move that training period? to a later period or different part of the day? Or is it better for us to go ahead and maybe find a different trainer if we really want to continue with the personal trainer that we have or that we're with a personal trainer? And those are tough decisions. I'm not going to say there's an easy answer here, but the reality of it is the bigger you make your bedtime opportunity, the more you're likely to sleep, the more you're likely to sleep, the better off your health and fitness are going to be. So this is a tough one. It's probably a quit something, but we've got to figure out what that is for you, and then you've got to decide how to make that happen. Here's a second scenario. Lately, you found yourself waking up in the middle of the night, unable to go back to sleep. You pull out your phone to look at social media. You feel this helps you calm down, but the report on your phone shows your screen time is way up. Stick, stick and pivot, quit. Now, I have some pretty strong opinions about this. To me, you got to quit the Facebook, the social media stuff. You got to quit that in the middle of the night. The lights off your phone are actually keeping you up. The excitement and the do dopamine stuff that's happening when you're on your phone is keeping you up. Whether you feel that way or not, it is. So the reality of it is you could do something better with that time and still be winding down. You can listen to a fiction audiobook and, and have the lights out. You can uh, actually get a hardcover printed book and turn on a candle, light a candle, and read that book. You can go ahead and decide to go into the bathroom and take a warm bath with some lavender and some other scents that calm really help calm you down and get back to sleep a little bit faster. So I would say you do you, you quit the Facebook. And then you implement something else in that place. Obviously, laying in bed awake at, at 2 o'clock in the morning for hours is excruciating. Uh, but you've, you've got to get your sleep. You've got to figure out a way. And getting on the Facebook is not going to be the answer most of the time. Now, how you do that, how you discipline, keep the discipline to do that, I, I can't help you there right now. But I can just say, if you value sleep as much as I do, you won't turn on your phone. You won't turn on your computer. You'll figure out a way to calm yourself, relax, whether it's breathing, meditation, a warm bath with some oils, or um, reading a book, uh, listening to an audio book. Any of those things will be better for you than opening up your phone. So I hope that makes sense on the sleep. Uh, side. You're going to have things, if you're going to try to improve your sleep, there are things you're probably going to have to quit. Screen time is a huge example. Having short sleep windows with early alarms, another thing that you need to work around. To get the sleep, you've got to be in bed. And, and that requires you to push your windows around and have some discipline around that. So I hope that helps you on the sleep front. If you've got some questions there, uh, we can talk about it.
So the next key driver or yeah, key driver is stress management. And this is another big one for me, but I really only have one example I want to walk through here. You've started setting aside 30 minutes to meditate each day, but you find you spend most of this time thinking about the things that you need to do. This leaves you even more stressed. Stick, stick and pivot, or quit. Now, this one's kind of also a little interesting to me because a lot of people will just quit. They'll say, okay, I don't have time for this. I know meditation would be great for me. I enjoy it when it's working, but it's not working most of the time, so I want to quit. I'd like to give you an alternative. Instead of trying to meditate for 30 minutes, just try to do five. Just five good minutes. Clear, concise minutes, letting your thoughts happen, letting things happen, and relaxing and getting into it. Now, eventually, you might be able to add a little bit of time to that. But obviously, giving up five minutes is not a huge deal in the grand scheme of 24 hours, and it'll feel more attainable. So you're not overwhelmed with the fact that you're losing a half hour out of each day to do this task. It won't feel as much like a task when it's only five minutes. And who knows, maybe you'll go a little bit longer even though you didn't plan to because you were able to relax and get into the right state of mind, helping your stress, helping you feel better, And that's going to kind of be a positive feedback loop. So in this case, I would say stick and pivot until 30 minutes feels right. And maybe it never will, but at least you've given it a shot. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. The next key driver is fitness. Okay. So here's the scenario. Your fitness tracker shows that your progress is stagnating. You're halfway to your set goal. And hitting, and hitting certain milestones. Now it looks like you won't make those milestones. So you've made progress and you were making good progress, but now things are stagnating. You're not seeing the growth that you were seeing before. You're not seeing the strength gains or the, let's say we're talking about the number of steps or how fast you can go or your time or any of those things that you would want as a, as a personal record or just some kind of measurement criteria for your fitness. And now you're stagnating. And that goal is beginning to look unattainable. At the beginning, it looked like you could get there, and now it's not. So do you stick, stick and pivot, or quit? Well, I think, you know, quitting this particular time is not the right answer. Um, You still have that goal. That's not going to go away unless you just completely change the goal. But rather than sliding the goalpost or the time to attain the goalpost, this might be a good time to stick and pivot. Maybe you just need to do something to change up your training. Um, Maybe you need to take some rest. Maybe this is a recovery problem. And maybe this is a nutrition problem. So all of those can factor into your basic performance. So it's worth looking at, is this a time when I change up my training? Is this a time when I change up my nutrition? Is this a time I look at other aspects that might be affecting my performance? And if I'm not approaching my goals as quickly as I wanted to, just see if adding some of those differences, fixing, tweaking some of those things gives you the benefits, gets you removing. I found like times where someone was doing a, a, a back squat, for example, and their back squat was starting to plateau. They're, so they're, they got to a certain strength, a certain capacity, and then they just seemed to slow down. And they were really upset because they did have a goal of, say, being able to squat their body weight for reps. And that's admirable. That's perfect. That's a, that's a great kind of goal because it shows a level of strength relative to your weight that's really, really important. So now they're not getting there. They're they're looking at they're halfway to their goal and they're just not quite getting there. So what I'll often do is I'll program other ways for them to work with the weight that's different. For some clients, I'll have them on the leg press because they're mentally challenged, not necessarily physically challenged. It's a lot of it's really it can be challenging mentally to get underweight, particularly when that weight's approaching your body weight and feel like you're in control. So I'll put them on the leg press. For other people, it's about their form and how they're pressing and where they're what they're doing. I may move them to a completely different exercise like a front squat, which changes the angles of everything and gets them working in a different way. And then when we transition back to back squats, they find that they've either, in the first scenario, increased their leg strength significantly, or in the second one, they, they now actually have better form 
and they're able to perform the exercise better. So in, in both of those cases, the changes we did, those pivots, are giving them the added capacity to be able to do more, and they start seeing that progression happening again. So that's a situation where I think a, a stick and pivot can be really good. For other people, they might just want to stick and keep grinding at it, and, and sometimes they're successful. Just push a little harder, do a little more, and they're, they're there. So just recognize that there are options as you're looking at fitness. So here's the second scenario. You're doing a fitness class, and after an awkward movement, you feel a tweak in your knee. There are only 10 minutes left in the class. Stick, stick and pivot, or quit. Now, this is a tough one because a lot of fitness classes have you on your feet moving around both forward and backwards and side to side. And so there's a lot of opportunities there for you to injure your knees if you're not careful with your form and how you're placing your legs and not locking out. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong. If you've already felt a tweak in your knees, then it's highly possible that you've done something to one of the tendons and ligaments to flare it up. That's what that pain is. and continuing and trying to grind out through that class is more likely to hurt you than not. It's definitely not going to help you. Um, you're going to have to slow down. Most likely you're going to be ginger on that knee, uh, and you're not going to get the full benefit of doing the class. Now, does that mean you completely quit, quit the class? And that might be no, it might be yes. It really depends on the nature of what you've done. But if you feel like all you've done is a little twist and, and maybe you'll be fine, uh, just slow it down. Go into just marching in place. If you want to continue moving for the remainder of the 10 minutes and not walk out in the middle of that class or actually towards the end of that class, then maybe the pivot is just you downscaling to a point where you're still moving and still getting work done and, and everything's great. Um, I, at one point in a CrossFit class, hurt my back. I tweaked my back and so I just quit. I, I tried to go a little bit further. I'm like, no, this is not working for me. Uh, I can't do these movements as well as I want to. I can't use the form I want to do. And it hurts. I stopped. I quit. Uh, and that turned out to be a really good decision because I didn't do exceptional damage to myself. I had done some, but it was really just a strain instead of something that could have been much, much worse. So recognizing your body's limitations, knowing when it's time to quit, when it's time to stick, or maybe just stick and adapt, a pivot. Uh, that's, that's, those are good. Now, uh, these, these questions about stick, stick and pivot and quit, when you start talking about fitness, are really, really hard because we have two things happening. We have this, this drive for ego that a lot of us share, and then we have this drive to laziness <laughs> that a lot of us have. Okay, so if you feel like you're quitting just because it's getting hard, or you're slowing down as a pivot just because it's getting hard, that's not necessarily a justified reason. Again, the exercise is helping. You can do it. You're not harming yourself. So in this particular case, there's not really a good reason to quit. But if you find yourself where you're pushing yourself past your boundaries, what you're capable of doing, and you risk injury, it is definitely time to quit. Or downsized to enough where you know you're not in, in harm's way. So again, that's a harder area, but it's one that you, if you want to stay in the game, which is key, you have to obey fitness rule number one, thy shall not hurt themselves. So managing how you do this and staying within that, that sweet spot of not letting ego get in the way and not letting laziness get in the way, that's going to be a key here. So the fifth and final health driver is avoiding toxicity. So here's, here's the first scenario. You're wearing a smartwatch, and this could be Apple, Fitbit, Garmin, whatever, uh, and you notice your heart rate goes up when you read posts from certain persons on social media. Stick, stick and pivot, or quit. Now, I know every one of us has some of these people that they turn social media into a battleground. They're always posting material that is just, it's just hard for you to stomach. They're a good friend. But some of the positions they take, some of the things they put on social media just really aggravate you. They cause you stress. They hurt you. Um, and you maybe you've even had a few conversations with them there, and they've always ended up poorly. Is this a stick? Is this a quit? Or is this a stick and pivot? Now, 
for most of the time, because it's social media, you know, my position is just go ahead and quit. You know, don't don't respond to their posts. In fact, maybe you can even do the function that allows you to unfollow them. You, this, you're still their friend on Facebook. You just don't see their posts. And if it's more egregious and it's a problem, then you just block them on social media. You tell them in person, I can't deal with your social media, so I'm going to block you. Nothing personal, friend, but I can't, I don't want that on my feet. I don't want that in my life. Um, so you you quit. In a sense, my social media, something that I maybe mean, I haven't talked about in here, is that I break my Facebook up into two profiles. So if you actually went out and searched for me, you would see that I have two profiles on Facebook. Now, one is my business profile, and that's where I interact with you. If you want to be my friend, you look up Alan Meisner. A dot CPT, and that's my my work, my training profile, and that's where I have conversations with clients. I have great friends in the industry, and I enjoy the conversations there. And I don't worry about the political posts. I don't even I don't even pay attention to them. And then I have my personal personal, which is family and friends. Uh, I would say ninety nine percent of those folks I actually have met in person and have personal relationships with. Um, and so, yeah, some of them are going to post some things that whatever I don't agree with, uh, but I only check that really to pay attention to friends and family and see what's going on here on the island. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on my personal, personal Facebook because it's, it's just not, there's just not material out there that I'm all that interested in other than staying informed about what's going on with my family, some of my friends and what's going on on this island. So that's the only time I check back on that profile and it maybe, maybe once a week, you know, so, uh, Again, I saw that that was toxic. I saw a lot of toxicity in that, and I came up with a pivot, and that pivot works very well for me. Uh, you can also, again, do the other pivots or where you're not necessarily blocking someone, but you're not following them, or other settings within your Facebook where you can control your feed and you're seeing the things that you really want to see without dealing with this much toxicity. The second scenario I want to talk about in the health driver of avoiding toxicity, you decide to read the label on your personal care products. And, and I'll tell you right now, the Environmental Working Group has a great app to help you do that. Uh, it's go to www.ewg.org forward slash apps, A-P-P-S. And this site, when you go there, you can literally scan the barcode with your phone, your smartphone, and it'll tell you whether this stuff is toxic or where it rates. So let's say you've now you've used that app and you've looked at uh, your personal care products and you notice that your favorite shampoo and conditioner rank very poorly on, the, on this rating scale. And so now here you are. You love, you love this conditioner and the shampoo. It works great. Uh, it makes your hair feel and look good. Uh, everything's awesome when, you're using, when you feel when you're using this product, but now you find out it has some problems. It has some allergens in it, maybe some carcinogens, uh, that type of thing. Do you stick, stick and pivot, or quit? Now, the thing about toxicity is it tends to be cumulative, whether it's chemical, biological, or social, or you know, relationship stuff, it tends to be cumulative. If you're in a toxic situation, it doesn't, it doesn't get better if you just reduce the amount of toxicity that you're taking in. It's still cumulative. It's still adding in. So for many of these things, you need to get away from toxicity. And I would say the answer is going to be quit. It's very seldom that you can pivot on those types of things. But, you know, there are there are exceptions. So if this brand of shampoo and conditioner that you're using uh, is a good brand and that particular type of product is the problem, maybe you move to another product that they have that's hypoallergenic uh, or has less of these things in it. And that's a better option for you to continue to use a brand that you enjoy and does and works well for you, but cut back on that toxicity. But in a general sense, I would say most of the time, the answer related to toxicity, if, if it's a product or a relationship, is to quit. <laughs> it's just to quit. No, that's e easier said than done, uh, but I have done it and you can too. So I hope this all made sense. I tried to come up with some examples that would show you on either side of the stick or quit model and then some that were in that stick and pivot range. As you can tell, this isn't as simple. And since there are thousands and thousands of things that you do every day, 
there's a lot going on. There's a lot for you to consider as you look at this. So for that reason, I would say focus on the big rocks. Think about the things that you do or don't do that would move the needle. So, and if you know there's things that you're doing now that just adversely affect you, like smoking, that that's a that's a no no brainer. It's a quit. Um, so there are things you're doing that really it's time to quit. There are other things that you're doing that are actually for good, but they're not giving you the results. That's a time to reassess. And as you're going through this analysis, I think it's really important for you to keep your why and your vision in sight because the things that you're doing should always align with that. If they don't, then it's a quit. So the why is the reason you're doing this. Why are you working on your health and fitness now? And when you come to that, it's this emotional deep thing. It becomes so important to you that there's no other option. You're not going to say no. Okay. So when you're doing these things, it's the question of, am I doing it the right way? Can I pivot? And then if it's not working, find a different route. Now, the vision is where you ultimately want to go with this activity, with what you're doing, with what you're eating, your fitness, nutrition, all of it. All those things are driving you towards some vision of yourself. And so you're building these little habits, these little mile markers that are measurable as you're going through this process. And as you look at what you're doing, if you're not seeing the progress to get to that mile, that next mile marker, that's time to evaluate. And when you evaluate things, you have to you have to get rid of things you can tweak and that's called the pivot and then things you just you just bear down and keep doing because they are working uh you just have to keep at it so if you're interested in exploring these things a little bit more you know whether you should quit whether you should stick and pivot or quit i'd encourage you to join us on facebook at our facebook group at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash group and there you can go ahead and ask questions. Maybe you have something you're dealing with and you just like a sounding board of, hey, what do you think? What are some ideas here? Uh, because maybe quitting doesn't really make sense to you and maybe sticking to it doesn't make any sense. So we've got to find that middle ground of the stick, maybe stick and pivot. So there might be these other alternatives that I can sh share with you in that forum. So again, go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash group. Go ahead and start a conversation there about your particular situation, and we can try to figure out the right alternatives for you. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Alan. You know what I love about the concept of sticking with something, sticking with it and pivoting or just quitting it altogether is that you have to make an assessment and make a decision. And while I absolutely hate the word quit, it's really hard <laughs> for me to quit anything. Sometimes that is absolutely the right decision. Yeah. And, and maybe you find another word for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, for me, it's like, okay, sometimes I just need to be upright with myself that I'm, I'm pushing myself further and harder than I should. And just taking that half step back or just overall, just quitting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're in a toxic relationship. You really have to evaluate that relationship and say, is it worth me keeping? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the answer is no. Um, you know, as we were going through, uh, the pandemic and being locked up, um, one of my friends that she was a client even here on the Island. Uh, was having a lot of issues and was lashing out at everybody. And, mm -hmm. and so I was like, no, I'm going to call her on her BS. <laughs> and I'm just going to say, you know, chill out. And she didn't mm -hmm. like it. And so we're not really friends anymore, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. We still see, sort of see each other on the island anyway, but I'm cordial. I'm not going to be a problem with it, but I don't need that negativity in my life. So I quit. <laughs> And yeah. it's hard and it's hard, it but it is, you know, you have to think about this holistically of your stress management and your fitness. And I think it's easier. We can talk about the fitness side because mm -hmm. quitting sometimes just, it just makes a lot more sense. You were, mm -hmm. earlier we were talking about this and you talked about marathon training. As we get into the heart of marathon season, there's a lot of legs putting on a lot of miles mm -hmm. and going through a lot of pain. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, October is the best time to run a marathon. The weather is probably the best it's going to be at least in the North here, but 
marathon training is no joke. And there comes a point where you might be hitting those peak weeks where your mileage is going to be the highest it's ever been. Your speed drills and tempo work will be the highest it's ever been. And you're going to be hurting. And on the one hand, that's the intention of a peak week is to put your body through the ringer, but then you come off of those weeks and you're, you're backing it down into the taper and relaxing and recovering until you hit the marathon until it's race day. But there's also that fine line where you could be digging yourself into a hole if you're injured. And, um, you know, if you've got that little, that little knee pain or maybe a little pain in the quad or the hamstring or something, you know, sometimes runners, our egos get to us and we go out there because we have to do the training. We have to go out there and run. We have to follow the plan. Otherwise we won't succeed on race day. And unless you're paying really close attention and, and stop when you're hurting yourself, then you're not going to make it to race day. And sometimes our egos just shade that we just can't see ourselves um, in that light. It's really hard. Yeah, it's it's kind of the interesting thing I noticed when when I was doing that that type of stuff, and like even when I do the tough mutters and Spartans and things like that, is there's so much freaking adrenaline going through my body. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yep, lots that, of that, adrenaline. <laughs> that I that quite literally I will do a lot better on that run than I trained for if if I didn't train enough. I I what I found was. Uh, I tended to overtrain. I tended to spend Mm -hmm. more time running longer distances than I really absolutely needed to do. For me, technically, I kind of evaluate like this. If I could run eight miles without stopping, I could do a marathon Mm -hmm. Uh, because the rest of that race is mental. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, as you're going through the training and you're thinking, okay, I'm in my peak weeks and I'm hurting and I'm going to start my taper. Um, I I just recommend people take five days off, Mm -hmm. you know, in five days, you're going to be able to, and drink plenty of water, make sure you're getting your electrolytes, do all the things that you need to do to allow your body to recover. Uh, And over that five days, what you'll probably find is all the muscle aches and pains go away, which kind of removes a lot of static. And now you can actually feel pain in other places like joints and things like Mm -hmm. that. And if you're feeling the pain in the joints, That's not something that's going to go away and it's not something you can train through muscle pain. You can train through, you can recover a lot faster. Those Mm -hmm. joint issues are, you're not going to be able to, but a lot of people, because they put so much stress on their body, they have both Mm -hmm. and therefore they can't really isolate where they're hurting because they're hurting everywhere. And, (laughs) you know, so, so just realizing that it's not a quit, it's Mm -hmm. a pivot. My plan was set. And then I'm like, okay, but if I'm going to be ready for the race, or at least be able to complete the race, I have to, I have to take that little step backwards. I have to take that, that recovery time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's time to pivot the plan. It's time to stick with the plan, but make a pivot and do the recovery that needs to get done. See a doctor. If you need to, if you find an injury that you just can't pinpoint or need help figuring out the difference between a strain or an injury. And then, um, if, if it's time to make that decision to DNS or do not start, it's, it's imperative that you take care of your body because our, our runner ego is really strong and we want to line up and gut out a race, no matter what, you know, we signed up for it. We paid for it. We told all of our friends and family about it. We're going to be there no matter what, but like you had mentioned in your discussion was go back to your goal, because if you're running a marathon, you want it to be a great day. You want it to be a celebration of all the hard work you've just put in there. You don't want to run yourself literally into the ground and making an injury far worse than it already is. There's always going to be another marathon. You can pivot and sign up for on another day when you're healthier and ready. So it's, it's time to make those really hard decisions. And they're hard. They are. They are. And, and one of the, one of the ways I like to kind of give you a visual of of how this whole process works is to think about each type of training that you're doing each time of nutrition or stress management, think about those as like, like channels. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you got your sides, I'm I'm running. So this is a race. I'm going to be running a race and I need to have this amount of stamina and speed and all that to be able to complete the race. And so then 
somewhere in that channel is your roof and somewhere in that channel is your floor. And as long as you're between your roof and your floor, you're doing what your body needs. If you start pushing up against that roof, which a lot of your hard weeks, are, that's what that's about. Is let's push our roof up. Let's try to get our roof higher. Let's raise the roof, I guess. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you're trying to raise that roof a little bit, okay? And if you push too far past it, you have the potential to injure yourself and break. So you've got to find that line and you've got to really listen to your body when you're at that point. So find your roof. Don't let your ego push you too far past that roof too often. Mm -hmm. I mean, occasionally, okay, you overdid it, you know, so your recovery is much more important, but in a general mm -hmm. sense, you didn't break. So that's good. You're right there at that point of stressing and getting outside your comfort zone with that roof. The other side is the floor. And that's just where you say, okay, I, I hurt so bad. Now I'm just going to quit. And again, you had a goal, you had a reason why you had something you were really after that didn't change. Mm -hmm. So if you let yourself just fall through that floor, then, you know, the, the term again, not a term everybody likes, but it's laziness, mm -hmm. you know, is keeping you from accomplishing your goal. So find your floor and always stay above that. Right. Find your roof. And only push that roof when you're in a particular point of training where it makes sense. And then you've got to tap that ego down so that you're not, mm -hmm. you're not breaking yourself. So find your square and find mm -hmm. your sweet spot. And wherever you are in your training, you're going to have times when, when you're down in recovery. And guess what you're not doing? If you're in recovery, you're still above your floor. Mm -hmm. At that point, mm -hmm. your training plan, not doing anything is still in your box. Yeah. And not feeling back. I need to be doing something, even though the training plan says to not do something. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. <laughs> yep. Don't well, do it. I like the question you asked earlier too was, is this serving me? Is what I'm doing right now helping me achieve my goal or could it be hurting me or keeping me from achieving my goal? And that's something to, it's a good question to ask when you're trying to decide whether you should stick with something, pivot, or quit it altogether. I think re reminding yourself, is this helping me is a yeah. good question. And, and that's where I was when I did my ultra, the 50 miler way back when it was okay. I, I wanted to do it. It was just, it was, mm -hmm. you know, is just, I felt like, okay, the percentage of people on earth that can run 50 miles at one time is very, at that point was very, very low. Almost nobody did it. Mm -hmm. uh, marathons were seen as this crazy out of the box. Why would someone do that? Well, why would someone want twice as much, you know, just, because, <laughs> yeah. just see if you can. Mm -hmm. And then I did. And I, you know, it was one of those things realized, okay, did that, that served the point, but you know, mm -hmm. I thought maybe I was going to run a hundred or do something and I'm like, no, no, my body, mm -hmm. that my body was very clear with me. You are not going to run a hundred miles in a day ever. Just don't mm -hmm. even think about it. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and so, you know, I knew where my box was. I knew where my roof was. But at the same time, I knew that just being in that high of a box on that channel in the long term would not have suited me. Mm -hmm. It was cool. It's something I can talk about and, and enjoy. Uh, it's actually still out on the Internet. Is like right as the internet was coming around in 95, I think. So, as you know, they published the results on the Internet. Um is the first time my name was on the internet. Um, and so it was just kind of one of those things of saying, okay, I did it, done it. Mm -hmm. um, what's next? And finding mm -hmm. another challenge, another thing that would keep me excited. Um, and then staying in that box. Every time mm -hmm. I've gotten outside of that box, uh, I've either put on a lot of weight or I've broken something. So yeah. I, I kind of know where my <laughs> box is. And it's like, okay, if I'm going to be healthy and fit, I have to stay in my box. And defining that box is the real challenge of all of this being comfortable pushing the roof uh, when you need to is also a big part of this. And it's, um, it's not easy. I, it's honestly mm -hmm. not easy, uh, but you have to listen to your body or, you know, get a trainer involved and listen to your trainer mm -hmm. uh, because they'll be able to see what's going on and tell you, okay, you know, what are we measuring here? What are we doing? How do you feel? Uh, some of it can be very subjective, but a lot of it can be what's, what's your um, H HVR or HRV. You know, how are you recovering? How do you, how do your, you know, these shorter, faster runs, how, how's your speed going? Are you getting the times and the, and the splits that you need for that? Um, and if you're not, then, you know, maybe you're not recovering enough and maybe there's something mm -hmm. and a good trainer will see that. Whereas if you just have a program, 
that you purchased or got downloaded for free off the internet, uh, you have to do that for yourself. And that's mm-hmm. really hard when there's an ego involved and there's an aspect of, oh, I could just not do this today involved. Staying in the box, that training is a lot harder, but mm-hmm. find a way to stay in your box. Yep. Yep. That sounds great. Great points. Stick with it, pivot, or determine when it's time to quit. Really good rules of thumb here. All right. Well, Rachel, that's all I have for this week. I'll I'll talk to you next week. Take care. You too. Thanks. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Sergey Young and discuss his book, The Science and Technology of Growing Young, an insider's guide to the breakthroughs that will dramatically extend our lifespan and what you can do right now. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.